Hello and welcome back to Lecture 3. In this lecture, we're going to start our discussion of the Hebrew Bible. I'll begin by outline, outlining the terminology that scholars use to refer to this text. We'll talk a bit about the so-called documentary hypothesis, and then we'll turn to an examination of the opening narratives, the creation narratives in the book of Genesis itself. The Hebrew Bible is, without question, among the most important foundational texts of Western culture in general and of the Western literary tradition, it's very difficult to choose which parts to focus on. The first point I need to address is the terminology that we use in referring to this book, or books might be a more proper way to put it. What we're discussing here in this lecture and the next several lectures is the canon of texts accepted by Judaism as the Bible and by Christianity as the Old Testament. One one term often used to refer to these works is Tanakh. That's an acronym for the three sections that comprise the canon in the traditional Jewish division. The first section, the Torah, so that gives us a T of Tanakh, consists of the first five books of the canon. This is also often called the Pentateuch, from a Greek term meaning five scrolls. So Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy are the Torah. The next section in Hebrew is called the Nevi'im, or Prophets, so that gives us the N of Tanakh. And the final section is the Ketuvim, or Writings, i.e. everything not defined as either Torah or Prophets, and that's where the K of Tanakh comes in. Now, in this lecture, I can only look very quickly at the Torah's composition and importance, and then we'll focus in on Genesis. I would refer you to the teaching company course on the Old Testament by Amy Jill Levine, who covers in far more detail issues that I can only touch on or just have to bypass entirely. In the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, we find many of the most famous and most important stories of the Hebrew Scriptures. This, of course, is where we get the accounts of creation, of the flood, the covenant with Abraham, the story of Moses, his life, his leading the people of Israel out of captivity in Egypt, on and on. Many of the stories that have loomed so very large over Western civilization, both in art and in literature, are found in these first five books. The only one we can touch on in any detail is the creation story. And I'll use that story as an example through which to address some of the questions about the composition of Genesis in particular, and of the Torah and indeed the Tanakh in general. Now, the first five books of the Tanakh are traditionally attributed to Moses, sometimes referred to as the books of Moses. And yet scholars generally agree that these books are the work of more than one author. Among the clearest indications of multiple authorship are the following. The Pentateuch, or the Torah, shows variations in its ways of referring to God. At times the word used is Elohim, and that's normally in English translated as God, with a capital G, of course. At other times the word used in Torah to indicate the deity is the four letters YHWH, often vocalized as Yahweh, and usually in traditional English translation translated as the Lord in small capital letters. If you can picture an English text of the Bible in your mind, you'll know that what I mean by the Lord in slightly smaller capital letters. So that's one indication of multiple authorship, these two ways of referring to God, Elohim or Yahweh. There are also variations in vocabulary and style. Now, I have to admit that I myself do not read Hebrew, so I'm having to take other scholars' word for this, but there are apparently variations in vocabulary and style in the writing that indicates writing at different times and by different authors. There are also con contrasting perspectives. Sometimes we get different versions of the same story. I'll come back to that in my discussion of Genesis. And sort of the equal and opposite of that, material is duplicated. You'll get the same story told about different characters, the same story told with or without variation in two different places. All of these and many, many other such things are seen as evidence by scholars that the Torah was written by more than one author at more than one time. And the most uh, widely accepted explanation of the compositional process of the Pentateuch is what has come to be called the documentary hypothesis, which doesn't mean documentary in the sense of a film describing something, obviously. It means that scholars have traced at least four different primary documents lying behind the Torah as we have it now. 
According to the documentary hypothesis, these four main source documents are what we call J, E, D, and P. And I'll explain each of those. There was a Yahwist narrative written in the 10th or 9th century BC. So that would be the earliest strand that we have in the Torah. It's called the J document because the documentary hypothesis was first developed by German scholars and in the German transliteration of Hebrew, Yahweh begins with a J. So the J document is the Yahwist narrative, 10th or 9th century. There was an Eloist narrative, normally called E, that was composed in the 9th century, a narrative in which God is referred to as Elohim. There was then Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Torah, was written probably in the 7th century, and that's referred to as D. And finally, a priestly source, or P, dates to the 6th or 5th century. So four different documents ranging over about 500 years. And according to the documentary hypothesis, not only were these documents written at different times, but the Torah as we have it was assembled in stages starting in the 8th century, when an editor or a redactor, as he's sometimes referred to, combined J and E. So first you had the Yahwist narrative, then you had the Eloist narrative. Someone put those together, probably in the 8th century, to give a document that we often call J-E. It's a hypothetical document. It doesn't exist anywhere, but that's the reconstructed process of composition. Around 500, a second editor added P, producing hypothetical document JEP, and Deuteronomy was added to the first four books of the Torah around 400 BC. These different stages in the text's development are discernible in the styles, the emphasis, the theological viewpoints of the different editors. And to take what I find the most fascinating example of the different voices detectable in the Torah, I want to consider the creation stories as recounted in Genesis. The Yahwist narrative, that is the earliest strand of the creation story, runs from Genesis chapter 2, verse 4b, through Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. According to this narrative, the Lord, Yahweh, created man in the sense of male human being from the dust before there were plants yet on the earth. And after creating Adam, a word that just means man in Hebrew, the Lord planted a garden and placed the man in it. The Lord then made plants grow, told Adam to till the garden, and gave him instructions about which plants he was allowed to eat. The man was prohibited from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 2 verses 16 through 17 says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. The Lord then decided that the man needed a companion. And first, the Lord made all the animals and brought them to the man, and the man named them, but apparently looked at each one and said, well, that's an elephant, but it's not my appropriate companion. That one over there is a kangaroo, but no, that won't work either. There's a zebra. No, that's not a companion for me. So the man named all the animals. Genesis chapter 2, verse 20 says, the man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. By the way, I'm using the Revised Standard Edition when I read quotations from the Bible in this course. Next, the Lord cast the man into a deep sleep, removed a rib from his body, and created a woman as a companion for the man. And of course, next, the serpent persuaded the woman to eat the fruit of the forbidden tree. She, in turn, persuaded her husband to eat as well. And this violation of the Lord's prohibition on eating from that tree led to Adam and Eve's expulsion from the original paradise, the Garden of Eden. Now, in many ways, this is the most familiar part of the Genesis creation story, but it's not the earliest part in terms of where how we read the story now. It's earliest in terms of composition. But the opening chapters of Genesis, chapters 1, verse 1, through chapters 2, verse 4a, the opening chapters differ both in emphasis and, surprisingly, in details. These opening chapters are the priestly account from the P document, and they focus on and recount the creation of the whole cosmos. At first, of course, there's a formless void, and then God creates light. Genesis 1, 1 through 5 reads, In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. 
And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. So after separating the primeval waters on the second day by creating the dome of the sky, God then creates the dry land earth and the plants on the third day. Then on the fourth day, he creates the sun and the moon. So the first, first four days of creation in the priestly account, the opening chapters of Genesis, are given over to the creation of the environment in which both animals and humans can live. On the fifth day, God creates swimming and flying creatures. On the sixth day, he creates land animals of all kinds, including humans, both male and female. This is where in the Genesis, in the, sorry, the King James translation, it says male and female created he them. God gives the humans dominion over the other creatures, and he tells them they may eat every seed-yielding plant and any fruit which contains a seed. Now, there are then two separate creation stories preserved in the first three chapters of Genesis. And there are some fairly noticeable differences between the two versions. Most obviously, the order of events is different. Just to recap, in the earlier Yahwist account, the order is man, plants, animals, woman. In the later priestly account, the order is plants, animals, humans, male and female. Two different accounts, different in the order and different in the emphasis. Quite apart from the different order of events, there are some other distinctions as well. The Lord of the J narrative, the Yahwist narrative, is strongly anthropomorphic. By that I mean he's treated in a very human-like way. He walks in the garden. He talks directly to Adam and Eve. After Adam and Eve have eaten the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God goes looking for them and asks Adam, where are you? Asks him, who told you you were naked? He talks directly to Adam. Adam and to Eve. God of the P narrative is far less anthropomorphic. He does speak, but he doesn't walk. He doesn't appear in the garden. In the P narrative, as I already noted, male and female humans are created at the same time, and thus there's no etiology, no explanatory story of female submissiveness. There's no idea that woman was taken out of man. They're created at exactly the same time, and the two of them together are given dominion over the earth and over the other animals. Also, the P narrative, the priestly narrative, is far more focused on cosmology and the creation of the whole universe than the J narrative is. The J narrative focuses mainly on human beings and their fall from primeval happiness. It tells us nothing about how the universe came into existence, how or why God separated the waters. Any of that is, all of that is missing from the J narrative. The J narrative's main focus seems to be to provide etiologies, reasons, for the harsh realities of human existence, including the necessity of work for males and the pain of childbearing for females. The P narrative doesn't address those issues at all. So two quite different focuses, quite different styles, one might say. Now, a fascinating aspect of the P creation narrative, fascinating to me at least, is its similarity to the creation narratives of other cultures, and most particularly, the only one I can talk about today, the Mesopotamian creation story, as preserved in yet another Mesopotamian poem that I haven't mentioned yet, the Enuma Elish. Those two words, by the way, just mean when on high. They're the first two words of the poem. They're not actually a title. They're just the first two words of the Mesopotamian poem that we call the Enuma Elish. In the Enuma Elish, the original state of the universe is watery chaos. This watery chaos is composed of two deities, two gods, a male, Apsu, who represents fresh water, and a female, Tiamat, who represents salt water. So the primeval state of the world is fresh and salt water mingling together. As they mingle together, other gods are born out of them, beginning with two gods, Lamu and Lahamu, who apparently represent silt, so I suppose if you're creating the universe out of the mingling of water, silt that can then build up into dry land is a reasonable way to do it. The story, it's quite complex, moves through several more generations of gods and culminates in a war among many gods from which the young god Marduk emerges victorious. And the cosmos attains recognizable form when Marduk kills Tiamat, 
and divides her body in two. Remember, as I said in the previous lecture, in lecture number two, Mesopotamian gods can be killed. And here's the primary example of that. Marduk kills Tiamat, cuts her body in two, makes the sky out of one half of Tiamat's body and the earth out of the other half. Now, though you may not immediately see it, several of these elements are traceable in the P narrative, the priestly narrative of creation that opens the book of Genesis as we have it. First of all, P shows God creating the universe from pre-existing primeval waters. Again, it says, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a form formless void, darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Now, some scholars think that the Hebrew word tehom, which is traditionally translated the deep, as in darkness covered the face of the deep, tehom, some scholars think, is cognate with Tiamat, that Babylonian goddess of salt water. If that's true, if those words are actually linguistically, etymologically related to one another, then one way of looking at this is to say that God's control over the deep, God's control of Tehom, parallels Marduk's control of Tiamat. Even if the words are not linguistically related, even if Tehom and Tiamat are not, if you trace it far enough back, the same word, God's division of the waters through creating a dome, i.e. the sky, pretty clearly echoes the cleaving of Tiamat's body of water to form earth and sky. In fact, this ex explains a verse that I always found utterly incomprehensible in Sunday school as a child. Genesis 1, verses 6 through 8, God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky. I never could figure out what was going on with that. What does it mean, the waters that are below the dome and the waters that are above the dome? And of course, the King James translation, firmament, just made things even more confusing. But this seems to reflect the same basic idea that the prime, primeval substance of the universe is water and that somehow that water is divided to create first the sky and then later the earth. Now, these are, I think, some fascinating parallels, but there are also very, very important ways in which the P narrative differs from the Enum Elish. Both narratives, as I've been saying, seem to assume a pre-existing watery void, which is then formed in some way or another into the recognizable universe. But in the Enuma Elish, that void is itself two deities, Apsu and Tiamat, and they bring forth other gods through a kind of sexualized reproduction. In the P narrative, the world only comes into shape through gods, direct intervention, not through the material that's there somehow mingling with itself and bringing forth more material, but through God doing something to the material. Now this is true even if we accept the view of some scholars that the first words of Genesis should not be translated in the beginning God created heavens and earth or even in the beginning when God created, but something more like when God began to create the earth was a formless void, which would seem to imply the formless void was already there and God came to work on it. Even if we don't accept that slightly more drastic translation, the P narrative posits that the original state of the universe, however it got there, was watery chaos. And it affirms that it required the creative agency of God to bring the universe out of that state. So very unlike the polytheistic view where the gods themselves are the universe, they mate with one another and bring the further elements of the universe into existence. That's a primary difference in the two texts. Also, in the Enuma Elish, the progress of the world from chaos into its present shape takes an unspecified length of time and relies on conflict between a plurality of gods. The whole process in the Enuma Elish is extremely violent and conflict-ridden. And finally, when the dust settles, Marduk, a young god, is victorious and becomes the ruler of the rest of the gods. The P narrative, in contrast, stresses over and over again the essential orderliness 
of the process of creation. The scholar Robert Alter, an Old Testament Hebrew Bible scholar, points out that this orderliness is achieved through a series of balanced opposites. He says, and I'm quoting here, P actually builds his picture of creation by showing how God splits off the realm of earth from the realm of heaven, sets luminaries in the heavens to shine on the earth, creates the birds of the heavens above together with the swarming things of the seas below. Darkness and light, night and day, evening and morning, water and sky, sun and moon, grass and trees, beast of the field and creeping thing of the earth, human male and female. Each moment of creation is conceived as a balancing of opposites or a bifurcation producing difference in some particular category of existence, close quote. So where the Enuma Elish shows conflict, uh, chaos, fighting, and finally one God emerging victorious, the P narrative shows God imposing orderliness in this series of bifurcations, as Robert Alter puts it. Now, it's perhaps not too fanciful to think that the author or authors of P may have written in intentional contrast to the Enuma Elish. I say that because P is normally dated to the period around or right after the Babylonian exile of the Jews. And let me stress that, the Babylonian exile of the Jews. The Jewish people were held in captivity in Babylon from 586 to 538 BC. That's about the time, the end of that is about the time when we think P was written. Now that's a good two generations of human beings who maintained their identity as Jews but grew up in Babylon, were captive in Babylon itself. In this context, a creation story reworking the Babylonian material into a form consonant with Jewish belief would make very good sense as a kind of reaffirmation of Jewish identity. You've heard the Enuma Elish, you've heard the creation story of our Babylonian conquerors, but no, that's not how it worked. It went this way instead. This is how Yahweh, or Elohim, our God, created the world. If this is correct, then the, the P story about the, human, about the creation of humans can also be read in contrast to the Mesopotamian version of the creation of humans and the Atrahasis, that Mesopotamian creation of humans story that I mentioned in the last lecture. The Enuma Elish talks about the creation of the universe. Atrahasis talks about the creation of humans. And you'll remember in the Atrahasis, humans were created to work for the gods, to take over the labor of the universe from the gods. In Genesis, in the P version, well for that matter in the J version as well, but particularly in the P version, humans are presented as the culmination of creation and they're created, I think it's quite implicit in the text, as a good thing in and of themselves. They're not created to work for God, they're not created to f perform some sort of function that God doesn't want to perform himself, they're created in and of their own right. So that's an very quick run through, very quick indication in Genesis of how the documentary hypothesis works, why we think, why scholars think that this text was written in several different versions at several different times, and also I hope of how understanding that can shed some interpretive light on what we do with the text itself. But the documentary hypothesis covers not only Genesis, but the rest of the Torah as well. Scholars have traced these four different source documents throughout the first five books of the Bible. And sometimes, for instance, in the flood narrative, they're connected in much more complex ways than they are in the creation stories of Genesis. In Genesis, we have first pretty clearly P and only P. Then we have pretty clearly J and only J. They aren't interleaved with one another. In the flood narrative, however, the narratives of P and probably J are interwoven with one another to form one coherent story, but traces remain of two different original versions. For instance, the source narratives differ about the number of animals to be taken on the ark, just to give one example. The P narrative requires only one pair of each animal, but the J narrative distinguishes between clean and unclean animals and requires seven pairs of each clean animal. And so you get that contradiction. Did, did Noah take just one pair of each animal on the ark with him, or did he take seven pairs of clean animals on the ark with him? The text says both, and that seems to be, seems to represent an interleaving of two different original versions. Now, <clears throat> 
In recent years, the documentary hypothesis itself has come in for criticism and revision, and not all scholars still accept it. I do want to clarify what I mean by that. The scholars who don't accept it are not saying, no, there was one and only one author. They're saying there were far more than these four source doc documents. It's more complicated than that. It's a more complex history than that. But the complexity of the narrative tradition out of which the Torah grew, whether we accept the documentary hypothesis or not, the complexity of the narrative tradition out of which the Torah as we have it developed seems undeniable. However the Torah took shape, it contains, as I've already said, some of the most important and resonant stories of the Western literary tradition, as well as, of course, the foundational stories of both Judaism and Christianity. This is particularly true of Genesis. Genesis not only recounts the creation story, but it, it also includes, perhaps most importantly, the stories of Abraham. And it's with Abraham, of course, that the Lord becomes a God specifically of the Hebrew people rather than the God of everyone. If we think about the creation stories, as I've just described it, by implication, God the Creator would be the God of all human beings on the, on the earth, right? If He creates the world and creates all human beings, then He would be the God of everybody. It's in the stories of Abraham that we get the idea of a covenant, the first um, emphasis on the idea of a chosen people, of God separating out Abraham and his descendants to be in a special relationship with God, to be the people of the covenant, to be in some sense God's chosen people. And we'll talk more about the covenant aspect of God's relationship with the Jewish people in the next lecture when I talk about Deuteronomy and the Deuteronomy mystic history. After Genesis, the next four books of the Torah Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy focus for the most part on Moses as hero, leader, and lawgiver. Tradition dates Moses to the 13th century BC, and so while these books are called the five books of Moses are traditionally ascribed to his authorship, if the documentary hypothesis is in any form at all correct, then Moses cannot have been the author of the Torah, though of course it's always possible that the Torah as we have it, particularly the earliest, the Yahweh's narratives, might preserve some of Moses' own writings or own words. But he lived in the 13th century, which is a good 300 years before the earliest written parts of the Torah, at least what we think are the earliest written parts of the Torah. His story, of course, contains a great many notable points. His importance is marked by the narrative of his heroic birth and childhood, the attempt for him to be killed when he was a, an infant thwarted by his mother, concealing him by putting him in the basket on the river, his rescue by Pharaoh's daughter, his growing up without knowing who he is and then reclaiming his heritage. All of those things mark him out as extremely important, as central in the text. He's also marked out by receiving theophanies, that is, direct visions of God. Uh, God appears to him, of course, in the burning bush. God speaks to Moses when he gives Moses the Ten Commandments. So Moses has a direct conversational, one could almost say, relationship with God, which marks him out as extremely important. Interestingly, and this applies to many of the other patriarchs in the Torah as well, Moses is at first unwilling to accept the task required of him. When God first picks him out, Moses says, you don't really want me, couldn't you take my brother instead? But he is, nevertheless, eventually he does accept the task that's put upon him. And he is, of course, the recipient and spokesman of the Ten Commandments. He's also the leader of the Israelites in their flight from Egypt, the person who leads the Jewish people out of captivity in Egypt. Perhaps the most haunting detail of Moses' story is that he leads his people within sight of the promised land, but he cannot reach it himself. He can only look over and see the promised land. He can't get there himself. Now, this strong narrative focus on Moses in the Torah probably led to the assumption that Moses himself had written the Torah, although there were always problems with that assumption. For instance, his death is narrated and how could Moses himself write the story narrating his own death. But as I've said, modern scholarship assumes that Moses could not possibly have been the author of the Torah, but his figure looms so large that if we think of the words, the books of Moses, if we think of of Moses not meaning 
authorship, but meaning the books about Moses, then I think we can still fairly refer to the Torah as the five books of Moses. So in this lecture, we've started looking at the Hebrew Bible by talking about the terminology, the documentary hypothesis, and looking in some detail at the creation stories in Genesis. In our next lecture, we'll continue our discussion of Torah by looking at Deuteronomy and the so-called Deuteron Deuteronomistic history.